going to start. We are here today to talk with Sylvia Martinez about Invent to Learn uh, and a newly expanded edition. And um, we want to show you just a few housekeeping things. And I always get really messed up when I try to talk and do these things. But you can see in Zoom down at the bottom, uh, you can see the other participants. There's a part for Q&A. There's a poll. I don't think we're doing any polls. We're going to keep this pretty informal today. Uh, and then there's our a chat window where we're all chatting right now. So instead of putting your actual questions in the chat, if you move them like really important burning questions to the Q&A, that will really help us uh, just ask Sylvia those questions. Uh, we've got Sylvia here. She is the one of the authors of Invent to Learn along with Gary Steger. And then we've got Tom Heck, our education extraordinaire. And then we have me. Uh, I like to, my new name, I'm, I'm new, newly named myself the instigator of pun. Uh, because since my job is to create things and try to get people to have fun with making, making and create stuff, I've decided that, that, uh, I mean, I like content creator as a name, but I also like instigator of fun because it just sounds cool. And yeah, this is, I finally work somewhere I can make up weird job titles. I might just change my new job title every month. So, all right. So Sylvia is here to tell us about Invent to Learn. And I wanted to show, I don't know if anyone has the old one and the new one, but the new ones on the bottom, you can see it's a lot thicker. So um, if there's a lot of new information, I like your new uh, epithet on here, the Bible of the maker movement. So yeah, Sylvia, do you want to tell, too. just like, we were, we said we would start off talking about engineering week, engineers week, and increasing awareness about well, engineering. I'll start off with the book. Um, oh, sure. Just go and go from there to engineers week. Um, okay. The the, the, it was time to update Invent to Learn. It had been several years, and as we know, technology moves on. The nice thing was that we didn't, have to, we didn't update any of the pedagogy. I mean, we're really proud of the fact that the book really is about the hows and the whys, uh, and give, giving people a picture of this in a historical context, and it's situated in good education pedagogy. And um, so a lot of the changes were in the adding new examples. Uh, there's more examples of people, of, of teachers from all over the world doing amazing things. There's uh, a preface where we talk about sort of the, what we've learned in the last five years, which is, you know, we've had, an, Gary and I have had an amazing opportunity to travel the world and talk to teachers. And, you know, one of the things that we've, we've learned is schools can change. You know, people say all the time, Oh, it never changes. It's so old fashioned. Nothing ever changes. It's like, you know what? When people want it, things happen. And it's, there's no magic wand. There's no seven step format. You, you know, it doesn't happen because you have one meeting. It's dedicated people who just catch fire with something. And I think for a lot of teachers, this maker stuff has really reignited the kinds of the, 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 the feelings of, of why they became a teacher in the first place, yeah. to, do, to have fun with kids, to share the world and do amazing stuff, you know, be Mr. Wizard for a day. And, and, uh, and it was, it was, it's been an amazing journey um, to talk to so many people who, who are just doing wonderful things. And, yeah. you know, all over the world, people say, is anyone else doing this? Like, yes, yes, yes. Lots, of, lots of people are doing it. It's just a really big world. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So. I love um, that. And then, of course, all the resources. It's like yeah. all the URLs, all the tools. It was, it was hard to decide what to put in this time because the last time, like the Makey Makey's on the cover, right? Right. It was like the only thing that was. There weren't a whole lot. There was Arduino and Makey Makey, and but we kept Makey Makey on the cover. You can sort of see it at the faint outlines of the Makey yeah. in the background. Because the Makey Makey is one of the things that really um, exemplifies what the maker movement in classrooms can be all about. I'm glad to hear that. You know, what's funny, now I'm trying to find it, because you had a whole section in here that was new, that was totally changed. I think it's the physical computing section. Oh, yeah. There were things during physical computing section, like, that I suffered with in 2012, 2013, 2014, just like, you have some of the things that they don't exist now. Like they're not kind of not a thing and now there's new things. Yep. And so uh, it, is, it is really a testament, I think, to, to Makey Makey that it could still be in there and still on the cover. Uh, I, I also noticed, and this one was new, was the things to take on a desert island. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, 
there's a little drawing. We're I gonna tried find to find it. Yeah, we're going to put that out as a poster. Um, I love it. Our little, our, the little TMI robot is relaxing on a desert island with his favorite technology tools. So, and of course, the Makey Makey is on the list. So. It's the first thing. I took a picture today because I was pretty excited. I was going to show Jay, and now I can't find it, of course, because I'm. I should have. I should have, you know, if I was really smart, I would have bookmarked all these things beforehand, but I kind of just like thinking of things I wanted to talk about. You know what else was fun is you put the things that have changed in the last five years, and that was it. The, ca the cane from Kane, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Kane from Kane's Arcade, like, grew up and kind of, like, is off the map. Well, like, all, the kids, all those kids grew up. I mean, Yeah, they grew up, and they're like, we kind of don't want to share our lifestyle anymore, which, you know. Well, I totally respect. So you know, I think that's part of the idea of the of the maker space in a school is kids can take on an identity of being a maker, but you know, the next day they could be a ballerina, the next day they could be a rocket scientist, the next day, you know, these the, these are things that kids go through. Yeah. Uh, that we can we can help support with really amazing tools and technology and and to segue to engineers week, yeah. some of them may become engineers. But that's not the point. Every, everyone's like, kids should code because they're going to get these great STEM jobs. And it's like, okay, so, you know, there's a, some kids will get good STEM jobs. That's fine. Right. But all kids should be able to have a vocabulary, to have a toolkit that they can dip into and say, I know how to do these things. I coded in third grade. I made, I made stuff with a laser cutter in fifth grade. You know, right. 3D printing. I did that in middle school. You know, so when these kids grow up, I don't care if they're artists or engineers or historians or mathematicians. I think they're going to have this powerful toolkit inside of them. And that's, it's all up to us today to make those things happen. Yeah, I agree. I think that's like really kind of the coolest thing about having a makerspace in your, in your school is that you get this, you get to try these things. And like, I guess, I guess I have one at home, right? And I have a 3d printer sitting over here. My kid, 3D printed something last year in third grade, and now this year she doesn't care as much about 3D printing because it was so cool last year, but that's fine. Like, she's trying on these things, and she gets these, these rich experiences that, you know, I don't feel like I got to have as a kid. So, um, and I also feel like I never was taught what an engineer was as a kid. So, I like this, this little segue in Engineers Week 2. I noticed you guys uh, had defined some things, like you defined engineering in a really beautiful way in the book. Um, so well, you I'm find that somebody asked in the chat if we covered micro bits, and yes, that's actually <laughs> we called it yeah. like for the micro future. bits is is in the new physical computing section. Uh, that's it definitely it's took on a big way. Sure, micro bits. It's yeah. I, I think it's going to be big. Uh, we um, you know, engineering um, I think is misunderstood. Yeah, it's not a subject in school, and that's right. that that's a very weird historical reason mm -hmm. because. In like the late 1800s, a bunch of university professors, like the you know, president of Harvard and the president of um, Princeton, got together and said, what do we want kids in high school to know? Because it was the beginning of the era where there were actually high schools springing up all over. Yeah. Said, oh, we want them to teach, you know, to know classical Greek and Latin. We want them to know, you know, mathematics and, and physics and chemistry. And that became the high school curriculum and yeah. those things were what young gentlemen of the time because you know like the, the girls weren't involved yeah. what young rich gentlemen of the time needed to know to run their their wealthy estates you notice there's no accounting right there's no engineering there's no uh, medical part in that curriculum because you know rich people hire people to do their own to take right. care of their books and to take care of their gardens and stuff so we're living this with this weird anomaly of a high school curriculum that completely yeah. ignores, you know, things that, that are important nowadays. And, you know, part, I think, part of this mission, I think, that we're all talking about is thinking about how these things can change, that we yeah. don't have to be bound by what the president of Harvard thought a young gentleman of 1892 should know, that yeah. we should be able to break out of those boxes and say, Engineering is crucial to everyday life. Everyone needs to understand the principles of taking on a challenge, of dealing with real world constraints, of you know, uh, estimating how to, to, guessing how to do something, trying it, and then doing it again. Yeah, and I, I love what you wrote here because like, I feel like 
I always feel like I'm, I have the imposter syndrome, you know, like I'm not an engineer, I don't have engineering background, but I do these things every day. So you have a quote here, I'm on page 42. Engineering is inventing. First, you have Orville Wright saying, we tried everything that had been tried before. Then we tried our own systems and we tried some combinations no one had thought of. Eventually, we flew, right? So it's just about trying stuff. Right. And like then uh, the origin of the word engineer is maker of an engine, uh, which is from engineum, which means a clever invention. So engineering is the application to design, build, and invent. Like, and it's really just looking at making the world a better place. And like that's, it's same, that's like- It's the same word as ingenious. Right, right. And that, and making the world a better place is like, you know, that's our company's mission is to, is to think about like, how can we look around the world and just reinvent things and just make our life a little bit better or a little bit more fun or, you know, all those things. So uh, I love this, uh, this definition of the engineering. So I put in some big questions that I feel like you probably, you probably get all the time. And I know, and this is hard actually, probably, because I put, you know, I read, I reread the first part of the book or read the whole, reread the whole book, but like this first part, I really like went into the meat and was looking at, um, you, you know, you talk a lot about student agency mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about, I mean, all of us, how do we get our admin to see that student agency is important and how can we share that playful and creative learning is going to create those in-depth experiences. I know we've had you know, I shared an email with you where someone had said, well, we didn't, you know, people don't really think playing is okay here where I live. Mm -hmm. And I feel like all of us have had that, you know, we've all had that uh, moment where like, uh, people kind of walk into the library and they go, well, why are those kids playing over there? Right. You know, and that, that's, that's definitely a big question. So I feel like the first step, if anybody's new, and we probably should have pulled everyone to see who had a makerspace and who doesn't have a makerspace, but Sometimes it's not about a physical space. I mean, it's never about a physical space. It's about this concept of letting kids play to learn. So how, um, how do, what, are, what are just some of your thoughts about these things? Like how can we advocate for student agency and how can we share that creative learning is a, a good way to learn and empower that uh, questioning over outcomes? Because I noticed you talked about that too. We all talk about that. Like we don't want to be about standards-based tests. Right, yeah. right. Um, so you know that that you're right this is this is a big question you sort of hit on on the approach um you know it, 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 in in the question mm -hmm. is it's kind of a chicken and egg thing like mm -hmm. you can't advocate for something you've never seen before mm -hmm. so you have to create opportunities and then how do you create opportunities if you've never seen them and you know so like for example with with the professional development that gary and i do um we always start with teachers doing things yeah you know, and some teachers go like well, I just came for you to give me a handout and tell me how the makey makey works or the micro bit works. And then I'm going to take it back to school. It's like, no, you have to like feel what it feels like. And um, we, we have this four day summer Institute called constructing modern knowledge. And oftentimes people feel out of their depth at first and teachers aren't used to that. You know, they're yeah. used to be, knowing everything and being in charge and they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know which group to join. I don't like the project. Well, I do like the project, but I don't like the people. And I like the people. I don't like, you know, so they yeah. go through all these kind of emotions. And then by the third or fourth day, they're going, oh, this is how my kids feel. You yeah. know, so the, the understanding of, of the classroom um, environment comes from understanding, per, from personally understanding, you know, how, how this happens, uh, how learning happens. Right. Um, I think you have to, what I tell people when I do keynotes, I say, there's too much to choose from. You can't, there's a fire hose. You have to be able to winnow some of this stuff out. Like, and the, and to, what I use is thinking about what I believe about learning. Mm -hmm. you know, it's nice if things are cheap. It's nice if things are, you know, have good instructions and stuff, but fundamentally the, this tool, technology, computer program, lesson plan, whatever you're looking at, match what I believe about learning. And I believe that learning can't be delivered to the learner. Learner is something that happens inside the head of the, mm -hmm. of the learner based on their own experience. So everyone is building a different sandcastle in their own head. Yeah. Every, every single person listening to this is creating their own, their own connections, their own thoughts. They're thinking about something they did in kindergarten. They're thinking about a teacher they had in third grade. They're thinking about what they might do with their class on, on Wednesday. And, and that's learning. 
Mm -hmm. It's not the words I say, it's what's happening in your head. Right. The, the third thing that I believe about learning is that it happens best when you're building something that's shareable with yeah. a community of people who care about you and that you care about. So, and look, I didn't make these up. The first part is Piagetian, you know, this idea that knowledge is a consequence of experience. He said it, you can read all the, you know, all the books that you read in grad school. They all say the same thing. Yeah. Um, it doesn't say tests are the way to, to, to learn things. <laughs> it is not a good, you know, that's not a model of learning. And the yeah. third, the, the, the part about constructionism is mm -hmm. from Seymour Papert. Yeah. And Seymour Papert is someone we talk about a lot in the book because we feel that his, his writing and his, his um, expression of how learning happens is fundamental to making making um, authentic and real and powerful in schools. Yeah. If you're just buying stuff, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Right, because it's not about buying stuff and it's not about the stuff. It's, and this was another quote I actually wrote down, uh, it's the socially constructive learning, because you're taking, the, because what a makerspace does and what I know from, you know, starting them in multiple schools too, is even seeing you take that learning out of the learner's head and into the real world learning becomes real and shareable because you have suddenly have this thing. So even if uh, I like to talk about my daughter's uh, brought home, my daughter brought home a strawberry basket on a paper towel tube one day. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> you know, and she was just like, it's my bird feeder. I invented at school today. And then like went into this huge, you know, conversation about why she made it and how she made it and all these things that I never would have known just from looking at it. So I really see that like that sort of example as a, a tangible thing, right? Like suddenly we have something we can share, like we have something to share my learning because you can see what I did. I mean, you may not actually see it, but I'm going to be able to talk about it and be able to bring it outside of my head. So I really love that um, socially constructive learning. It's such a powerful phrase. Yeah. I think it's, it, it's often misunderstood. I think, yeah. A lot of people think of, you know, programming as someone that, you, you know, you're very isolated, you do it all by yourself. Um, but I can tell you, I was a professional programmer. Um, we talked a lot more than we sat and typed because yeah. if you're just, I mean, sure, you're one person making an app all by yourself. That's one thing. But most big engineering firms, you have to talk to other people. You have to be able to relate and yeah. listen and think about, well, what are they saying and how is that different? Do I understand it that way? And what are they saying? And um, it's, it's really something that uh, should be taught more in engineering schools, honestly. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, I, I think it's, it's, I think the people, a lot of people who are doing makerspaces are doing a really good job. Yeah. Having students work in teams, um, you know, having them work on things that are relevant, um, things that they care about and you want to talk about. If you have something you want to talk about, you're going to exercise those muscles. There was just a study out that said that ELL students do really well in makerspaces. Yeah. Right? Because awesome. they want to talk about what, what they're making. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you, if you have one, and once you have something like that set up in your school, I mean, you'll see that a kid will bake something and then turn around and tell someone else how they made it. And I always, I always like to bring that up. Like you don't do that with math. You're not like, Hey, check out how I solve this math problem. Like I mean, yeah. maybe some kid does, but like <laughs> most kids don't do that. Uh, the problem is, is it's not that, that it's math that, that isn't like that. It's that the right. math we teach in school, this very narrow little thing that we call school math is not like math in, yeah. in the real world. I can right. tell you, you know, when engineers talk, they're talking about math. When mathematicians talk, they talk to each other all the time because that's how you get these ideas out of your head. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, it, one, I was do the, the word origin game again. <laughs> word technology is a really interesting word. Yeah. It, the, it's a techno is a Greek word for like artifact, mm -hmm. things, you know, you make. And logo means word. Mm -hmm. But the Greeks had this philosoph you know this philosophical idea that words weren't just parts of speech words were the reflection of what was I of what was in your head and yeah. when you said things out loud it made them real and you know this is the ancient world that was big news back then now we don't think that's so well, that seems kind of obvious but back then 
the, the word logo had a very powerful meaning. It means that things in your head come out into the world and technology means that things in your head come into the world and human beings make them. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's a very powerful metaphor for this idea of design. What's in your head becomes real in the world. You project your intentions, you project your thoughts, your wishes, your dreams into the world by sheer force of will, by sheer, you know, by taking advantage of all the technology. I mean, look at the stuff that's behind you, Colleen. Yeah. The, the thousands of years of people working hard. Somebody, for, you know, somebody invented the screwdriver for the first time and the pair of tires and, and there they hang on your wall, you know, and we were like, oh, everyone can use a screwdriver. But I mean, all of these things were incredibly, you know, amazing in their day. And okay, this, I had, you made me, I had to get something off my wall. All right. Uh, Jay asked me, he was like, what is that madness? You have jars on your wall. And it's because someone engineered this really smart way to put a jar on a pegboard. So all I have to do is unscrew it to take it off. Like, and I, I was thinking about in the book too, you talk about uh, technology is something that wasn't invented before, or was something that was invented before you were born. Like there's some quote about that. But Alan Kay said that. Yeah, Alan, Alan Kay, Kay, that's what I was thinking. invented the personal computer. Yeah. Um, make connections. Alan Kay invented the personal computer because he went to the MIT Media Lab and spent time with Seymour Papper and Cynthia yeah. Solomon and the people who were inventing the logo programming language, the grandmother of Scratch. Yeah. And, and Seymour said, kids should have computers. The power of, co of computers is to put them in kids' hands so that they can do things that we have not thought of before. Yeah. And Alan Kay, they, the, 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 there's a napkin in like the computer museum in San Jose where he sketched the first laptop computer on the flight back to, to California wow. from, from, the, from these meetings. So the, the very idea of the portable computer was because Papert and people like him had this idea that um, kids should have the most powerful technology available to them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, but then if they can't afford them, how do they start making without any funding? So look, there was making well before there were computers, right? Yeah. I mean, and a lot of kids don't get those experiences these days. You know, who tinkers in their basement workshop with, you know, with their, with their kids? Um, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, so, I think I think hammering and nailing and with putting things together with scraps and you know uh, doing artistic things, bringing art into the everyday lives of kids who don't have the, uh, you know those experiences available. All the things that we talk about are being taken out of schools and replaced with testing on stuff that that to me is, is not even real. You know, it's not right. it's not real world now. Um, you know, so. That said, absolutely, you can have a fantastic experience making things, but there's something about technology that mm -hmm. makes it worth going after. Um, first of all, the computer you can use for any kind of idea. The computer can, can be a musical instrument. It can be a calculator. It can run sensors and timers. It can connect to a makey-makey. You can program on it. Even the cheapest computers, you can go online and use Scratch. And programming is making. You know, yeah. a lot of people think, oh, it's just typing. No, what you're making is something that you can share with the world. Yeah, I had someone question me about coding being making and uh, something else like that, like something about, about computing not being making. I was like, how is that not part of the makerspace? That's all part of it. So yeah. I think everything you just said answers your chicken and egg story from before right? Because if we start making with cardboard and we start, now I'm going too far. <laughs> Broke it. Uh, we start making with cardboard, then we can go, then we have these, these in-depth experiences, you know, like I was doing uh, my invention literacy project with students was just basically like, how does something work and how can I make it with cardboard? And if they wanted, they could add a makey makey or a micro bit you know, and add sensors and whatever, but most kids wanted to start with what they were familiar with, and that was cardboard, right? Like, they wanted to start there. So, I think then you develop that rich experience, and you can show your admin, hey, look, see, this works. Now, can we get some money <laughs> so that next time they can do this again, but, like, make their inventions even more amazing, and I think, 
I think we've seen that over, over the last few years, you know, in, um, in people like you spotlighted in the book, like in Andrew Carl's classroom, like you can, in Josh Berger's classroom, you can see how those things are growing, you know, at a phenomenal rate because of what uh, they started doing five years ago and are able to do now. And Aaron Riley, who you mentioned earlier, because, you know, uh, when you said like kids get better at doing things, yeah. somehow also the community gets better. I, right. I hear from a lot of teachers that say the kids' projects get better every year. I mean, it's yeah. not like the third graders are back again doing, you know, learning more. Somehow this year's third graders know more than last year's third graders. Yeah. And in, in a school, you know, where there's a lot of making going on, that kind of expertise does develop and you will see you know, kids just raise the game. It's a natural thing. Yeah. Um, so we kind of already talked about all these things, so I might move it on past, but I did love this quote that science is about wonder and risk and imagination because that was kind of uh, written about in the book about how like, you know, we don't teach science like that. We don't teach science as a wonder and a risk and imagination. We're not really seeing those things um, in school. So, it's, you know, like you like the quote from Orville and Wilbur Wright, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they were just like, well, first That's of all, that. they were bicycle mechanics. So yeah. they, had some, they had some essential skills that yeah. helped them think of the ideas. It's not like they just wandered in and invented an airplane. Yeah. Um, so, you know, nobody's saying that this is magic. Mm -hmm. uh, kids, you know, they, they should learn how to, how to hold a drill properly and, you know, how to hammer a nail properly and do all these basic kinds of things. Um, but what happens in school is we, we then look at it backwards. Mm -hmm. After people, you know, a hundred years later, people have developed all these theories of flight and, you know, we know why wings work and all this stuff and theories of turbulence. And, and then we say, well, if we teach the kids all these theories, then they can build an airplane. It's like, well, that's not how the Wright brothers did it. Yeah. You yeah. Know, the theories really can't exist in a vacuum. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you throw these words at kids and they don't know what you're talking about. And a few will, you know, a few kids always will get whatever format you're, you know, selling. Yeah. Um, but what about the rest of the kids? You know, how can you create experiences so that every kid can have the kind of experience that, that, that works for them? I'm not talking about the kind of differentiated instruction or you know, we teach one kid who has a kinetic, you know, I'm not talking about that. I, I, I think though that when you, when you, when teachers create interesting prompts and challenges for kids, um, kids will, will start, like you said, in a place where they're familiar. Mm -hmm. and then they'll start to see, they'll start to, if they succeed at that, they'll take risks in other areas. Mm -hmm. Now, those, those risks and, and areas of familiarity may be different for different kids. You know, some kids may, may start out feeling very comfortable programming. Some may start out feeling very comfortable about cardboard. And part of that is kind of the teacher's alchemy, right? You mm -hmm. look at kids and go, hey, why don't you try programming? Hey, why don't we play backwards day and we'll switch roles for a day? You know, you, you kind of cheerlead them into taking those risks, so that, right. but without, without forcing them, without saying, you know, count off one, two, three, four, you're the programmer, you're the builder, you're the... You know, yeah. uh, you know, um, so it, it, I think that another thing people don't real, don't understand about the maker movement is the essential role of the teacher in the classroom. Yeah. It's very different than a community maker space mm -hmm. you know, where you go in because you want to make a whatever and you learn how to use the 3D printer and you use it. A school is a very different place. And you know, not all kids are hackers. Not all kids are going to walk in the door and be like, yeah, I can do that. Um, so you have to be really encouraging to the kids who, who might feel like it's too big of a risk while not get, making it too prescriptive for the kids who, who might, you know, do it. Right. On their own. So I think people think that teachers just sort of dump a bunch of cool stuff on the table and step back and go, oh, now the magic is going to happen. And then they're disappointed when kids fool around or you know, waste materials or, you know, yeah. the, the teacher's role is extremely, there's a whole chapter in the back of the book called Shaping the Learning Environment, which right. is exactly about that. Um, I think that what we can do is empower everyone on the call that they can all add instigator of fun to their job title because that's, that's really like what you're doing. You're instigating fun and you're instigating that moment. Uh, and I brought up the, uh, the, some of the, just the phrases I love that you have in the book, like design tinkering. 
Uh, and then the, the process of think, make, improve. I mean, you really are instigating fun because once a kid makes something, I love the improve and the fix and make it better uh, leg of the robot because that's really, because a lot of times when we see even with writing, right, a kid uh, does their brainstorming, they write their paper, and then that's it. They're like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to go to improve. They don't want to make it better. They don't want to fix it. So your job as the teacher really is to instigate those moments to kind of push them a little further. Hey, and I feel like uh, we all got taught that with the I wonder phrase, right? And sometimes that really helps like, oh, you know, I really like the way uh, I saw, and I, I kind of do that sometimes. I saw something someone had posted like, oh, I like the way this project, you know, is a secret order of things. Well, I wonder if you could add the secret order makey makey hat and will that work? Can you do that? You know, and then that all of a sudden you're like, you're just kind of pushing a little bit more, like go a little bit further, uh, try, you know, another avenue for your idea. And I think that is really hard to come across. It's hard to teach people, you know, those phrasings and, uh, you know, being, you're like the ultimate encourager. You're an encouraging instigator of fun. <laughs> Part of it is, is that the teacher needs to become familiar with materials and what the tools can do. Right. So not making, you know, insane suggestions. I mean, like, oh, if you yeah. to a kid who's, who's made a project with like eight LEDs and eight batteries, you can say, you know, I bet you can make that with one battery. Yeah. You know, that's, a, that's a good instigation because you know it can be done. Yeah. Uh, because you've done it before. So I think for a, a lot of schools, I'm telling them buy less stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, buy stuff that really counts, that you can get good at, that the kids can get good at. And developing fluency is just as important as having 17 perfect tools that you're going to like spend a week on this and spend a week on that. And it's like, yeah, but how does it go together? When do yeah. kids decide what they're going to do? When do they yeah. step back and say, what do I think about this, this thing do, you know, that I care about? Um, the idea of it being the, the, the child's work, the child's project, I think requires teachers to sort of make a mental flip in some cases. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of teachers who come to CMK and say, you know, I, I t teach the kids and teach the kids and teach the kids and they just don't get it. And, so, and sometimes we, uh, other teachers will say, to them, do less, yeah. you know, explain less. <laughs> don't spend too much time explaining. If you've got 17 steps, make it 10. If they've got yeah. 10, make it five. If you've got five, make it two. Um, and, you know, let kids sort of like find their own level with stuff. I think um, that all brings me to, uh, I think it was, Pepper was talking to Congress about uh, teachers aren't learners. Mm -hmm. Was that Congress or was that? I think it yeah. was. He, he makes this like, it's, it's around the time where he talks about the, um, the French world uh, thing, but uh, he's talking about uh, teachers aren't learners, like, and they need to be learners because we want learners to learn how to learn, right? Like it's, it gets a little wordy when you say them all the time, but this quote of like, letting our students see us struggle mm -hmm. to learn right? See, you see me, and I, I know that's something I always tell uh, people when I'm talking about starting a makerspace or starting making or starting with anything. You don't have to know how to use everything. It is good to eventually get there so you know that you don't right. need eight coin cell batteries for eight LEDs, and it's good that sooner or later you're going to understand that concept yourself, but it's good for them to see you struggle. It's good okay. for them to see you learning because then you're modeling the learning process yourself so the way to learn that one you can use one battery instead of eight batteries is to make something with eight batteries yeah it's not to learn the theory of batteries and electronics and then design you know well you're laughing but you know a lot of people are very fearful yeah. about like doing something wrong and it's like no let them put eight batteries in and then yeah you know, and teach, I, teachers come up with these really clever ideas like um, you know, giving kids like a shop, a, a budget, right? So everything in the closet is labeled, you know, there's things that are a penny, there's things that are five cents. Yeah. You know, a micro bit is a, is a 50 cents, you know, and you have a dollar to spend on your project. Yeah. You start get you start understanding when you have to conserve, which is a, a, a number one engineering principle yeah. is you're always working within con some constraint, budget, yeah. time, gravity, you know, whatever it is, there's some constraint on your project. And yeah. putting constraints on kids is not like telling them what to do. 
Right. You're, you're drawing the box. You're not like coloring it in for them. Yeah. I mean, I think creative constraints are kind of what, that's what makes things great. And uh, Tom actually taught, and I were talking about that earlier in the invention literacy workshop, the design challenge and the time constraint is what makes people do a great, like make something great because they have this time and they're confined to it. Cause if you have too much time, I mean, the same is true with writing a book, right? If you have no deadline, the book's never going to get finished. Right. But if you have a deadline, you're going to work really hard to get that book done. I was laughing uh, because uh, I have to give an honest moment of um, when I bought my Forest Mims intro, intro to <laughs> electricity book. And I just could not read it and try to like understand it but just from playing with paper circuits and makey makey i've learned you know that i don't need eight batteries uh, and it is i've just learned so much from playing and people are often ask me that how do you know how to do all this stuff well i just played until i figured it out right. uh, and i think that that so that's one thing we didn't talk about in our time is like really close to up uh, or it's already over but you know we have no real time limits because we just do what we want because you know we don't care <laughs> We're recording it so people can watch later, you know, so if anyone needs to go, we're sorry. Tom, I hope you're, I lost, I can't find the chat anymore because I put it in screen share and now I'm worried that, um, I'm also worried that it's going to like share going the on. chat. It's like yeah. crazy. There's so many people chatting. It's great. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to let Tom bring some thoughts, but uh, what was I going to say? Oh no, I lost it. Uh, Okay, so our yeah. last thing that I was gonna say, oh, I know, I know what it is, it's perseverance. Uh, and it was uh, talking about, you talk about, you know, there's this, mo there's this thing, and I do wanna say this before we go to the end of, you know, c shutting off, because I think it's important for everyone to think about and hear. We don't push failure, right? We don't set up fake failure moments. So what, just by design tinkering, which you had earlier, and playing and trying to invent things and making something with eight batteries, that's where you fail and you learn, you know, oh, I don't, I don't need this. You know, my teacher said I only have 50 cents to spend. I can only use one battery. How many LEDs can I light up with one battery? Suddenly they're trying to figure those things out. So we don't have to set up failure. So I really love that, uh, that idea of perseverance. I, I don't know. You had something in the book about, about that that I was reading. So, you know, one of the things we said in the book about perseverance is that children will persevere at things that they care about. If yeah. you're asking kids to show determination and grit, you know, all these popular words about something that they don't own, that they have no, that they don't care about, you're just asking for compliance. There's a yeah. big difference. Um, and, you know, when we, when we're a team together and we're all struggling, you know, goes back to that, that quote you put up, when we're all thinking about how to do something better, we, we want to, to, to make each other happy. We want to be a community that wins. Mm -hmm. uh, we, all kids want to change the world, you know, and they look at superheroes and think, that could be me. Well, mm -hmm. it can be me in a real way with mm -hmm. the kinds of tools and technology that are, that are available today. And, and, you know, we have to have teachers who are brave and put it in front of kids and are willing to learn themselves and, and think about, you know, what, what modern learning really looks like. Oh, I feel like we should address this if we can do it quickly, just because I had that really long email I sent you. And then Tom, are there big questions that we really need to ask? <laughs> Cause I As did Sylvia that said, it's very active. It's really cool. I, okay. I, we could probably spend an hour on some of these, but there, there, is one I think that is worth answering, uh, and and that is um, mindset. Mm. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, condense some of these. Okay. Is um, so Sylvia, um, we have done a really uh, excellent job of training kids in school. My own kids. I've got a 15 year old daughter and 19 year old son. My son's in college. Of um, essentially going to a classroom and waiting for the teacher to say, I want you to give me X, Y, and Z. So you're in a French class. Um, the French teacher says, I need you to have this assignment done to me. And it's, um, and so for example, my daughter, who's a really good student has become a heat seeking missile 
to determine what the teacher wants and delivering that thing. Oh, yeah. And, and so this question, um, there's been a couple of things that have come up around this that I'm watching the chat and questions, which is essentially how do we uh, change the mindset because it seems as though the maker space um, provides uh, not so much lasered, I want you to hand in this thing mm -hmm. um, that, it, yeah, that you can fit in right. here and it's all very easy to grade um, as opposed to uh, all on the other end of the spectrum of, I don't know what you're gonna hand in to me uh, so how do, how do we address that? And I realize we're kind of running out of time, but do you address that in the book? So, so yes, uh, there's, there's quite, a, quite a bit in that about practical suggestions for you know, project-based learning based on, you know, this isn't new. I mean, we didn't just make this up. We're really trying to ground it in good practitioners of project-based learning and progressive education uh, from Re the Reggio Emilia movement to uh, you know, the, the, the project approach uh, to, uh, uh, you know, this, this idea of messing around, which is really crucial. Um, and all, all of that is in the book. And I won't try and condense like three chapters. Um, it, it's, it, it's something that a lot of teachers say that, that they have to go through an active kind of unschooling process where they really have to convince the kids that they aren't, you know, if the kids just don't ask set the 17th time, what do I have to do to get an A, the teacher's gonna finally give it up. Because, <laughs> you know, that's the way we train them, right? So I guess the good news is, is we taught them to, to ask those questions, but we can unteach them to ask those questions. But it takes time and it takes uh, trust because you can't say, there's no test, there's no failure, it's all okay, except for the quiz on Friday and you might get an F. You know, it's like the, the kids see that so fast. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just say blah, 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 fail, early fail off, and, and then we'll study for the test. Kid, you know, kids are completely willing to play whatever game you're dealing out. Um, and, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of kids who are really good at school. They get good at school. And we want them to be good at other things, too. Um, and, but we don't want to, like, screw the kids who are good at school. It's not like... You don't count, you know, it's like, so we have to kind of like make sure that everyone's included. We have to make sure that, for example, uh, if you have competitions, if you're in the first Lego league, what about the kids who don't feel comfortable competing? Competitions, statistically speaking, have gendered outcomes. Yes. More girls tend to take a step backwards when there's uh, any competitive element. Now, I know there are girls who win first place. No, I get it. I get it. You know, it's not this kid does exactly this thing. Um, but ask yourself, how can we have, say, a, uh, a, a maker fair in addition to a robot competition? Maybe the maker fair has prizes for the weirdest robot or the slowest robot or the silliest robot or, you know, something like that, where ki other kids can have those experiences, those good experiences that the first Lego league, first Lego league kids are having. And, you know, I, I, I can't criticize anything that schools do to get kids interested and that, that fires teachers up and that asks teachers to, you know, think hard about what they're doing. Um, I think, though, that there are ways to include more kids. Yeah. Uh, that goes, you know, and, and that goes beyond. Of course we want boys and girls. Of course we want all cultures, all ethnicities. We want kids who are not doing well academically to participate. You know, so you have to think about, if we're not letting kids take a makerspace class because they got a bad grade in math, or they got a, you know, a bad, uh, you know, participation grade or something like that, we're t shutting the door to the kids who very well may need that class the most. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's a thousand ways to do these things. There's no one right way. There's no blueprint for a makerspace or a curriculum that's gonna work for everyone. It's about thinking hard about what's right for your kids, where you see them going in the future, what lights their fire, what lights your fire, and trying things, you know? You try something, it doesn't work, 
you try it again, you tweak it a little, you change it up and, and you know, hopefully all you administrators out there are making it possible for teachers to, to do the same kind of iteration that you're asking kids to do. You tell kids, fail early, fail often, well, you better be, tell teachers that too. You know, you wanna try a new class or a new project and it just completely doesn't work and the, 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 the materials are wrong and the kids are, it's just awful. Yeah, well, that should be okay. Yeah, that should be okay. <laughs> yeah. Should be celebrated. That should be like, oh, wow, now we have a lot to talk about. Yeah. If everything was perfect, we, you know, we'd have nothing to talk about. Um, well, this is, uh, I, I, what I wanted uh, everyone to hear is that clearly this is a topic that you have addressed before, Sylvia, and it's in the book. And this is why, frankly, when, when I'm leading workshops and teachers um, get uh, a little stressed about this, Tom, this was fun, but how am I going to uh, justify this? Yeah. Right. This is my, where my easy answer is, just buy and vent to learn and <laughs> read that, and then you'll understand how to make the case. There's literally a chapter in the back that says, like, say this, not that. Like, <laughs> yeah. You, know, you, you say, also... You know, like, the, the roof is falling apart, so therefore we can't buy a 3D printer. It's like, the, the building repair and the instructional budget are not the same, right? Right. Why are we freaking out and, and pretending like, you know, 3D printers are some, you know, something from Mars? This is, this is just another instructional tool. Teachers can learn to do this. Kids can learn to do this. You know, a, a lot of people say, oh my God, how do I learn how to do this? Um, and it, it, when there's no this, it's not like, well, what's the list of stuff I have to learn? Where is it? Um, you know, I, I think sometimes like, it's like improv, right? Improv actors work really hard and practice a lot and then get on stage and do something they've never done before. Yeah. I think teachers are exceptional improv actors, even if they don't think of themselves that way. And there are ways to build those skills of, of looking carefully at what the kids are making, talking to the kids about, about their thinking process, asking them you know, to, 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 to take the next step, um, to challenge them with something wacky or something interesting or something fun. Um, and you know, Colleen, I know you talk about fun a lot. <laughs> I think it's crucial, and people know this. They know this. I know they say, they say the words, well, if it's fun, it can't really be learning. And yet, I think down deep, when we connect with parents and say, how do you learn? How was it when you were a child? What's the best learning experience you've ever had? They say, the, they say things like, I got to mess around with an engine. I got to tear something apart, and it was so much fun. And it was like, aha, right? We're not damaging your child. We're not experimenting on your child. We're not just fooling around. We know what we're doing. We're professional educators. We know what we're doing. I think it's so important to, to stand up and, and, and say what we believe about learning because the rest of the world says stupid stuff. And we've got to counter the stupid stuff with smart stuff. And parents, they'll listen. They really will. I, tr I truly believe that. I hear that around the world. Um, when you include parents in what you're trying to do, when you don't just send home one piece of paper and then act surprised when they don't know what's going on. When you include students, you give students roles as technology leaders, you tell them, why do we think this stuff is so important? You let them help, you let them make decisions, you let them, let them read all the different 3D printer technical you know, support issues and decide which one to buy, and then buy it. You know, and that creates, pride of ownership, it creates a community, it creates uh, a place where your students, your parents, your teachers, um, and, and your community feels like the school's working in all of our best interests. Okay. That's my, that's my. That you know. was good, you were great. We well, have, uh, um, we have gone like. Stuff that I would love to share. Um, yeah. I, can, I can add things to the, to the chat maybe, or send you guys things. We have summer institutes. I'm, I'm keynoting at a bunch of conferences coming up. Yes, uh, we're going to give Gary a little bit. <laughs> Gary and I are doing um, four days in Texas, four single day workshops to get kind of a taste of, of what we're talking about. Um, April 8th through 12th, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas. Uh, it's, it's, it's only a day. It's not a big commitment. 
uh, come and see what all the fuss is about. And, and everybody who comes to the, to the Texas ones gets a free copy of the new book. Awesome. So, um, we're come to Connecticut. Yeah, absolutely. I want, I, I absolutely will come anywhere. Okay. People send me an email, say, come, I'm going to Atlanta in June. I'm going to Chattanooga, Tennessee in June. Um, and I'll be at a couple conferences. If you look on my website, sylviamartinez.com, you'll see my schedule. You'll see all the stuff that, that is there. Oh, we were just in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, see, somebody that goes to the, con the Chattanooga Lab Institute, that's June. Yeah, yeah. we'll be back. So see, Gary, I was gonna, I'm going to say two things before we're totally, totally out. There is a big section of, like, Gary says all these prompts for robotics or programming or something. And because I remember there being one about, like, the slow race. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's in here. I can't remember which chapter because I kept looking for it and I couldn't find it. So we're going to give away these books. I think we should make Tom do it uh, because he's been yeah. chatting actively with the people. <laughs> so, so the Invent to Learn is our book, but the, I have to say the Invent to Learn Guide to Fun and the Invent to Learn Guide to More <laughs> Fun are by Josh Berger, who is an absolutely fabulous uh, uh, teacher, artist, um, and it's a big collection of projects, how to do them, ideas for extensions, challenges and prompts, all laid out. And they're good for elementary and middle school, and you can make them good for high school. Uh, they're they're good, geared towards younger kids, but they're still really good projects. Yeah. So, uh, and then this one's signed by you and Gary. We did. We signed oh, it. Oh, we're going to say them slow. They're actually all on the blog post, too, that led to this Zoom with Amazon links, but... Uh, you can, these are all from Constructing Modern Knowledge Press, which is yeah. so is, CMK uh, Press, if you want to yeah. type that in. If you go to CMK Press, it links to all of the books. Um, right. The Invent to Learn is also in Kindle. Um, the Guide to Fun is not because it's just so yeah. full of pictures and stuff. It's 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 hard to scroll through. Yeah. So uh, someone said that can we do this again? We are we are going to do another webinar. Like we do it. We're going to do web our goal is every month. Can I share so. a secret? Yeah, got, and then we want to share the secret book. Be ready for a secret. This I'm is so excited. There is a new, this is backwards, right? It's going to come out backwards. I can, I can see it. Perfect. Oh, see, okay. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a brand new book by Aaron Riley called The Art of Digital Fabrication, which is going to come out in, a, in about uh, two months. And it talks about all the kinds of things you can do um, within the, in the crossovers between art studio and makerspaces. So mm -hmm. it's looking at steam uh, in, in a really new way. And it's, it's absolutely got fantastic projects in it everything's laid out ideas about what to teach and um if you go to cmkpress.com and sign up for the newsletter you'll be on the list you'll be notified about how to how to uh, pre-order this and um this will be out i'm next month or so next so. month yeah so i was telling sylvia books before we started and some of y'all might have heard me talking about erin but she is amazing she is just Aaron. like uh, we were talking about her having this artist mindset and she just really like, she gets making in this whole, like, she is a very creative, amazing person. Uh, yes, you're in Connecticut. Go all see her. Here. It's all <laughs> right in this very book soon. Uh, where is she? She's, she's outside of Greenwich, right? Yeah. 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 And the publishing site is Constructing Modern Knowledge CMK Press. Press. Mm -hmm. CMK Press. Yeah. CMK oh. -R -E I don't know why I'm saying it out loud when I could type it. Well, um, Constructing Modern Knowledge is our summer institute. So that we always spell out. Yeah. Um, okay. So I tried to go to the internet to find the thing and I lost everyone again. So I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that chat. Maybe uh, Tom, you can find the CMK link and put it in the chat. So thanks Sylvia for joining us today. We went we went for an hour anyway because we just oh, well. had so much fun talking and we There's couldn't There's so help much it. to talk about. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Hey, when, when the book comes out, we can do it again. We can do this anytime, anytime you want, Colleen. Yeah. I'll do anything for you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, Tom, Tom, Tom. We need, we need to uh, give away the books, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Who do you want to give them to? Well, all right. So we Did have three books, correct? Yeah, we have three books. Okay, Where's so... Here's what we're going to do. If you want to participate in the book giveaway. They all do. They showed up. <laughs> yeah, I know. So what we're going to do is you, I have three numbers between <laughs> zero you made them and 500. Oh my goodness. Zero and 500. So uh, we're going to take the people who are closest 
to those numbers. And yeah, go ahead and type in your numbers. Oh, good grief. <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> I don't know if this, oh I'm gonna regret God. doing this, but we're, yeah. we're, I'm gonna, so I, as soon as I say stop, I'm gonna type in the word stop. And then I, uh, Colleen and I are gonna, I'm gonna oh. tell you the three numbers. And uh, the first number will be for the book Invent to Learn. The second number will be for Makey Makey. Uh, I'm sorry, we're not giving away Makey Makey. We're giving away all only books. I guess so, the second uh, send one, you know, I mean, we could do that. <laughs> I guess we could. So, uh, and then the last one will be for the third book. Okay, so here we go. So I, as soon as I, I'm gonna, if you- Hey, I have an idea, Tom, because we're not gonna be able to get all these numbers. How many numbers do people get there's to type? There's only get three numbers, one. it'll be easy. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to put it, I'm going to type in the word stop. Okay, so we're only looking at the numbers after that. All right. So here we're are the three over numbers. 500. Um, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> so complicated. Yeah. So, so here are the, here are the three numbers and I'll explain how we got these numbers. Uh, Invent to learn is numerically 169. Uh, I Googled, uh, I Googled this. Make, uh, makey Makey is numerically 110, so 169, 110, and Engineer, to celebrate Engineering Week, is 77. So we're looking for 169, 110, and, 170, or, and 77. Oh so, my goodness. Uh, um, what we, you're going to get to look through the, we're going to look through the chat. We're going to let everyone go because it's just, <laughs> yeah, and so we can look through the chat. Is, We'll, we'll contact you afterwards, but those are the numbers. All right. So, many numbers. I know. I'm like, I'm so bad at math. I'm just like, stop saying numbers. All right. Kathleen Fugel won one of them. Her 175 was her number. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Look at All that. All right. So we're going to thank you guys. And we are going to be back next month, um, probably around Pi Day. And I think we're talking to Trisha Rolfe. And then I know in April, we're definitely doing a robotics talk with Hummingbird. Uh, robotics and cool. Katie Henry's because I know Sylvia and Gary love the hummingbird robotics too. So. They are awesome. Um, I'm gonna say goodbye and I'm gonna hit into the recording. So thanks everybody for joining us today. <laughs>